Hello, welcome to lecture 22 of ELEC Eng 2 CI5. In this lecture, I will go over second order circuits. Um, these circuits are the circuits that contain two energy storage elements uh, as a capacitor and inductor. Um, and we'll see how we can drive a solution for this uh, for these circuits and impose initial conditions and uh, you'll see it during that that there is some similarity between the analysis of second order circuits and then analysis of first order circuits okay so let's uh, let's start do that and uh, we'll see that in the next slide that the, the equation governing these second order circuits is a second order differential equation Okay, so as we indicated in the previous slide, um, a second order circuit is a circuit that has two energy storage elements, uh, two capacitors, two inductors, one inductor, one capacitor. Um, we can show that the current and the voltage, um, in the, yeah, maybe the current through an inductor or the voltage across the capacitor, the equation governing these quantities, which are, and these are all functions of time, are all second order differential equations. Um, and uh, these circuits include what we call LC series resonance circuits, very important circuit in electrical engineering, and the uh, LC barrier resonance circuits. So when you put a capacitor and inductor in parallel, this is also used a lot in oscillators and um, in filters and so on. Okay, the general formula we're going to take a look at is this one here. Uh, d squared x of t by dt squared plus a1 dx by dt plus a2x of t is equal to f of t. This is an equation, a second order differential equation. x of t here can represent the current through an inductor or the voltage across a capacitor. And our target is to uh, use the mathematical work that was done this area to find the solution for a given circuit. So if I give you a circuit, second order circuit, and then I ask you find for me the current and the voltage, you should be able to do that. This differential equation has two solutions, like all ordinary differential equations. It has one solution when the, imp the input is equal to zero, and this solution is due to the energy stored in the system at time zero. And the second one, when you put some excitation here, this is called the particular integral solution. So we have two solutions, the homogeneous solution when you have zero here, f of t is equal to zero, and this is a solution due to the energy stored in the system at time zero. And you have the particular integral solution when f of t is, has its actual excitation value. Okay, the derivation I'm giving here that has been covered in previous mathematics courses. I will just go over it very briefly. Uh, this is a homogeneous equation, so you got, you got rid of the excitation that you have in the circuit. And uh, this, this one here can be put in this form d squared x by dt squared plus 2 zeta e t, uh, omega naught dx by dt plus omega naught squared. So omega naught squared is equal to a2, and once you know omega naught, which is square root of a2, you can get zeta uh, because 2 zeta omega naught is equal to a1. Okay, these are the coefficients of your differential equations, which, was gonna, which, which will depend on the different parameter of your circuits. Now I will show you that the solution we are going to be getting for the differential equation will depend on the values of a1 and a2, and these values are represented by the values of zeta and the omega note. Omega note is, is, is an angular frequency, and zeta is actually a damping factor. In the way we learned in differential equations, they ask you to assume a solution of the form ke to the st. You substitute in the differential equation when you differentiate twice e to the power st, you get s squared e to the power st. When you differentiate it once, you get s e to the power st, e to the est, s multiplied by e to the power st. And uh, here, this is the term. So, this is the same differential equation we had before d squared x by dt squared plus 2 zeta omega naught dx by dt plus omega naught squared x of t is equal to 0. But we assume the x of t to have the form k multiplying by e to the power st. And the s is, is the natural frequency. Okay? Now, after you substitute in the differential equation, every time you differentiate relative to t multiplied by s, this is what you end up having. You can get rid of k because k is non-zero. Okay, get rid of e to the power st as well. You obtain this um, uh, second order uh, equation, algebraic equation here in s squared. 
So you can solve for S. You can you have here two solutions, um, and uh, this this will be your first solution. This will be your second solution. This we call them natural frequencies, characteristic frequencies. Um, this is how they are called in mathematics courses. Notice one important thing: if zeta is greater than one, then bo both s1 and s2 are going to be real because square root of zeta squared minus one will be uh, a real number. S squared zeta squared minus one is is positive. Then the square root is positive. Then you get two two real solutions. If zeta is exactly equal to one, then you get the same solution minus zeta omega naught minus zeta omega naught. We call this a critically damped case. If zeta is if zeta is greater than one, then you get two different roots. Okay, one with a positive sign, the other one with the negative sign here. Okay, uh, so if zeta is greater than one, you get two different solutions, and we call this case the uh, over damped case. If zeta is equal to one exactly then this square root becomes zero, and this one becomes zero, and the two solutions are the same, minus zeta omega naught, and we call this one critically damped case. The third interest, the case which I believe is the most interesting one, when zeta is less than one. When zeta is less than one, you obtain a complex quantity, because this becomes square root of a negative number. Uh, so we take square root of minus one as j, then both of these roots are going to be complex numbers. Okay, and this will lead, as you studied before in uh, in uh, in differential equation, this will lead to a cosine and sine solution, to a combination of cosine and sine. So we have three cases, as we said. If zeta is greater than one, then the square root is positive, and we have two different solutions. S one, S two are distinct, and this is this is this is our solution. This is our our homogeneous solutions. Both S one, S two are real and different. This is called the overdamped case. How do I find the, the constants K1 and K2 from the initial conditions? Okay, critically damped case when zeta is equal to 1. When zeta is equal to 1, the square root will give you 0. And the two solutions are the same. So S1 is equal to S2. And in that case, uh, from the theory of ordinary differential equations, you get K1 e to the S1t plus K2t e to the S1t. When a root or a characteristic... Um, a solution or characteristic frequency gets repeated twice, you multiply by t to get the second term. Okay, again, here we have two real roots, but the two roots are natural frequencies. Two natural frequencies are the same, they are both real and they are the same. The third case, which is a very interesting case, when zeta is less than one, then in that case, square root. Um, square root of zeta squared minus 1, which we get in the solution, will be a complex number. So what we do, we take we, we take minus 1 out from here, okay? And minus 1, square root of minus 1 will give you j. Then we end up with these two solutions here. This is a complex number. This is its real part. This is its imaginary part. This is the second complex number. This is its real part. This is its imaginary part. And the two are different. Plus, you have here plus and minus. So the first root is minus sigma 1 plus g omega d. The, seg the second one is minus sigma 2 minus g omega d. Uh, sigma is really an attenuation factor. Omega d is the angular frequency. Okay. So the solution actually, and if you take this one to the time domain, as you have learned from your mathematics courses, I'm not going to get into this de these details, you'll see that the general solution now for your problem is cosine omega dt, sine omega dt, and then multiplying by e to the minus sigma t. So sigma is an attenuation factor, and the omega d uh, is really your angular frequency here. So you get sinusoidal, sinusoidal behavior for your signal. Okay, so we have three different cases. The overdamped case, S1, S2 are different and are real. Okay, you get the critically damped case, zeta is equal to 1, S1 is equal to S2, both of them are real, and then you get your solution which has t in it, the third solution where you have the underdamped case, which is this one here, zeta is less than one, you get two complex roots, and one of them is conjugate to the other, and this will give you cosine and sine, because the solution must be real. Even though we got complex roots, but when you put them with the, pro the proper coefficients, they must give us real signal, okay? So what does this mean, overdamped, critically damped, underdamped? 
If this say this is a voltage across your capacitor and you'll see it's gonna reach some steady state value in infinity and this steady state value say it's called A. Okay, let's assume for that for now. Then the the overdamped case will will gradually slowly reach go from zero say up to the steady state case. The critically damped case where the two roots are the same, they are both real and are the same, will will reach the will, will reach the solution faster. You can see it's rising up to the solution faster. This is a critically damped case. The under damped case, you can see it will show some oscillations around the main values because you have a cosine and sine terms and this cosine and sine may or may not be attenuating with time so this will give rise to some oscillations and usually when we design such a system we try to limit these oscillations they should not exceed a certain value and so on call them overshooting value or ratio um, the, all this you're going to learn about it when you study more filter theory okay but just keep in mind the difference between these it, it the, if if the if you if your signal represents a voltage across a capacitor or a current through an inductor, this will determine how how is the signal gonna reach the steady state value. Is it gonna be critically damped, so slowly and gradually reaching the steady state, or it's gonna be cr critically damped, so over damped is this one, critically damped is the blue one. It will go faster, it will settle faster to the solution. The steady state solution or under them it's going to show some oscillations around the steady state value and this oscillation is gradually and slowly die with time if this is the case sometimes you don't die with time and you end up having uh, infinite oscillations and as i will show you that in a second so keep this in mind this is the difference between the critically damped the over damped the critically damped and the under damped the last part that remains in the solution is a particular integral. We talked about the three different types of the homogeneous solution. Um, we consider only the case when f of t is a constant a. Then in this case, the particular integral is equal to capital A, which is equal to f of t divided by the coefficient of x of t, which is a2. This will give you the particular integral. And uh, now the general solution is the sum of the homogeneous solution, which can be uh, critically damped. Uh, under under damped or over damped and the particular integral solution okay let's take a look at an example we have here a circuit we have an inductor and a capacitor in series and we close the switch at time zero would like to find an expression for vc of t for any time assuming that the capacitor had no zero voltage in the beginning now because the capacitor had zero voltage in the beginning so we know that vc of zero is equal to zero one interesting thing as well, because the inductor, this circuit was open, then there was no circuit in the beginning, then IL of zero was zero. The current flowing through the inductor was zero at time zero. But remember, the current flowing, the induct the current flowing through the inductor is the same as the current flowing through the capacitor. These two are in series. Then this means that the capacitor current at zero must also be equal to zero. Okay, it's a very important thing to notice. Because the inductor current cannot change instantaneously, then I L of zero minus zero, which is going to be equal as well to I L of zero plus. But I L, the inductor current immediately after the switch was closed, is still equal to the capacitor current. Then the capacitor current must be zero. So we know something very interesting, that this circuit forces the capacitor current to be equal to zero in the beginning and forces its voltage as well to be equal to zero in the beginning. Okay, so now we're going to write the second order equation governing the capacitor voltage and then we'll solve it to find the homogeneous solution, the particular integral solution, and then we find the, the, all the constant coefficients. Okay, so we have here one, one loop. This is simply one loop. The, the governing equation can obtain by writing KVL. 12 volts is equal to the voltage drop across the resistor plus the voltage drop across the inductor plus the voltage drop across the capacitor. Okay, the voltage drop here is equal to I C multiplying R. The voltage drop across the inductor is equal to L D I L by D T. But remember, the inductor current is the same as the capacitor current. The current is flowing this way. Okay, the current is flowing this way. This is I L, but this is the same as I C because they are in series. Okay, so we can simply say here the inductor current, the inductor voltage V L is equal to dl dil by dt but il is equal to ic and then the last term we're going to add is vc of t now we get rid of ic of t and replace it 
we know that the capacitor current is equal to C dVc by dt. So we differentiate one more time, you get second order derivative relative to t. Replace IC here, but C dVc by dt, you obtain first order derivative. So now this is our second equation, second order equation. We, re we reorganize it in the same form we had. We have to divide by RC. Actually, excuse me, I have to divide it by LC. I have to make the coefficient of this one, of the second order derivative, equal to 1. Because this is the form that we had. We had d squared x by dt squared plus a, a1 dx by dt plus a2 x of t is equal to f of t. So I made here this coefficient of 1 by dividing both sides, both sides by LC. So when you do that, this is what you'll end up having. Okay, this is what you end up having. So I divide both, si both sides by LC. This becomes d squared vc by dt squared here. If you divide this one by LC, you get r over L. Okay, if you divide this one by LC, you get 1 over LC. If you divide 12 by LC, you get 12 over LC. So, this is how our system looks like. Remember, this is the same form that we started with. d squared x by dt squared plus a1 multiplying dx by dt plus a2 multiplying x of t is equal to f of t. And f of t here is a constant, so the function of time. This is the equation that we started with, and we know the solution. This term, we call this term omega naught squared, okay? We call this term here 2 zeta omega naught. We call this term here capital A. We call this coefficient as well as well A2. So the, the particular integral solution will be capital A divided by this term. So 12 over LC divided by 1 over LC will give us 12. Okay, so now we know we know all these numbers. We know that this one microfarad, this one L is 100 millihenry, R is equal to 1 kilo ohm. So I can get this coefficient, I can get this coefficient, and I can proceed to solve the system. Okay, so I compared with the form that we have. We found that omega naught squared is 1 over LC. L is 10 to the minus 3. C is 10 to the minus uh, 6 here. So if you, uh, if you take the square root, you get that uh, omega naught is 3.16, 2 to the power 3, and this is radian per second. Also, we know that 2 zeta omega naught is equal to R over L. R is 1 kilo ohm. Actually, L here is 0.1. It's 0.1 only. Okay, so it's, it's 10 to the minus 1. It's not 10 to the, 10 to the minus 3. It's 0.1 Henry. Um, so if you divide these two, you get 10 to the power 4. And you know what's omega naught is this number, so I can substitute, I get zeta, 1.58. Because zeta is greater than 1, this means that I have an overdamped case. I will have two natural frequencies that are both real and are different. Okay? This is the first natural frequency, minus zeta omega naught plus omega naught square root zeta squared minus 1. This from the theory we drive together. We know omega naught, it is this number. We know zeta is 1.58. If you calculate this one, you get minus 1,127. This is the first natural frequency. Second natural frequency is obtained with the negative sign here. Again, substitute for zeta, substitute for omega naught to simplify. You get minus 8,873. So this is our solution now. K1, e to the, S1, e to the power S1t, plus K2, e to the power S2t, plus the particular integral solution, which is capital A divided by small a. And when you divide them, as I explained, you get 12. Okay? So now, this is our solution, general solution for the capacitor voltage of this second order differential equation. Now we, we start to impose our initial conditions. At time zero, we know the capacitor voltage was zero. So this will give you one. This will give you one. So you get K1 plus K2 plus 12 is equal to zero. I have, I have to get two conditions to get K1 and K2. The first one is that the capacitor voltage at time zero is equal to zero. The second one is that the capacitor current at time zero is equal to zero. How do I get the capacitor current? I differentiate this one relative to T and multiply by C and set this one equal to zero. And this will give me the second equation to calculate K1 and K2. Okay? So and remember, second order differential equations you have two unknowns, K1 and K2, so you need two boundary conditions. You need two initial conditions. The first one here is the, is the capacitor voltage at the beginning is equal to zero. This was given. The second one we're able to determine which at the capacitor current at zero is equal to zero. So, 
As we agreed in the beginning, this, this was open circuit, okay? Then there was no inductor current because there was no inductor current. This means there was no capacitor current because they are in series. Then IL of 0 is equal to IC of 0 is equal to 0 ampere, okay? Um, we make, this is this not treated properly. This is ampere here, okay? So I can clarify that. Um, so this is the equation that you have to force. You have to say that the capacitor current at time 0 is equal to 0. So C dVC by dt is equal to 0. So if you differentiate the voltage that we just have, the derivative of e to the S1t will give you S1 e to the S1t. The derivative of F e to the S2t will give you S2 e to the power S2t. The derivative of 12 will give you 0. Okay, and the capacitor current. I do I, I'm I'm missing here just one term here. Uh, just to be just to be accurate, this whole thing will be multiplying by C. Okay, so multi because the capacitor current is equal to C dVC by dt. Now I'm gonna set this whole thing to zero, so this C will disappear. This will give me K1 at time zero is equal to zero. So I'm gonna if you put T equal to zero here, you get one from this term. You get one from this term. So you get K1 S1 plus K2 S2 is equal to 0. I know it's S1, it's minus 1,127. I know it's S2, it's minus 8,873. So this will give me one equation, another equation between K1 and K2. If I solve equation 1 and the equation 2, I obtain, um, I obtain these coefficients here for K1 and K2. Just solving two equations, two unknowns. The first one is that the capacitor, the volt, the capacitor voltage at time zero is equal to zero. The second one is that the capacitor current at time zero is equal to zero. So now we determine K1 and K2, and then we have the general solution for the problem. So if you put everything together, we determined K1, we determined S1, we determined K2, we determined S2, and we have the particular integral. This is the general expression here for the capacitor voltage. Of course, after you get such an expression, you should check that it satisfies the initial conditions. If you put t equal to 0, you are going to get here minus 12. The sum of these to give you minus 12 will cancel with 12. Then indeed, the capacitor, the capacitor voltage is equal to 0 at 0. If you differentiate this relative to time and multiply by c and set equal to 0, you'll see that you will also get a capacitor current in the beginning equal to 0. Okay, so this indeed is our solution of this uh, ordinary differential equation. Okay, let's take a look at one more example here. Um, we have uh, an inductor and a capacitor in parallel, and uh, we would like to find the natural frequencies of the of the current I L. Um, so, this circuit, this switch here that we have, was closed before time t equal to zero, and then you opened it. What's gonna happen? This circuit will start oscillating for infinity. Nothing. What's gonna? Th there is nothing that damps the energy here. The inductor will allow current to flow. It will use to be charged to charge the capacitor, and the capacitor will discharge its charge through the inductor to allow another current to flow. So you'll see that they keep on exchanging energy every half cycle. The inductor charges the capacitor, and then the capacitor charges the inductor. It keeps on going on for infinity. And this is a, this is called the battery resonance circuit or a tank circuit, very well known circuit in electrical engineering. I will show you how to analyze this circuit when we write the differential equation. But first, we have to set the initial conditions. Because this switch was closed at time zero, this means that we had steady state already. Steady state means the inductor is short circuit, the capacitor is open circuit. So this means that the current going through here, because this is short circuit and this open circuit, it's 10 over 5, so it's equal to 2 ampere. So we know that IL at time 0 minus, just before the switch was opened, is equal to 2 ampere. Okay? Okay, so this is something we know. And we know also that the inductor represents short circuit. Okay? So then we know that the voltage across the inductor at time 0 is equal to 0. But the voltage across the inductor is the same as the voltage across the capacitor. And the capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously. Okay? Then we know this, this important thing, which it's really these two forces together, that VL at time 0 plus, so after you open the switch, will still be equal to 0. Why? We agreed the inductor, the inductor voltage can be discontinuous. But because it is, it is in parallel with a capacitor, and the capacitor forces the voltage across it to be continuous with time, then the inductor voltage will continue to be zero after the switch is opened. Okay? 
So we have now two, two boundary conditions we can use or initial conditions. The first one is that the inductor current at time 0 plus is going to be equal to 2. And this is because the inductor current at time 0 minus is equal to 2. So just before you open the switch, the inductor current quality change instantaneously is going to be the same. And the interesting part that the vo inductor voltage also will not change instantaneously because it's parallel with the capacitor and the capacitor does not allow a uh, sudden change of, the, of its voltage. Okay, so uh, this, is, this slide is simply uh, uh, summarizes what I said earlier. Time zero, when the switch was closed, this is short circuit, this is open circuit, we were at steady state. Then the inductor current at time 0 minus equal to 10 volt over 5 ohm because this is short circuit will give us 2 ampere. And I say, I'm, I'm saying it clearly here, VL of 0 minus is equal to VL of 0 plus, plus equal to 0. Why? Because in the time 0 minus, the inductor represents short circuit. Then the voltage across it is equal to 0. So this is okay. But when you, when you open the switch, the capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously. In the beginning, it was zero, like the inductor voltage. But the capacitor voltage will not change instantaneously. So even after the switch was open, the inductor voltage will continue to be equal to zero instantaneously, okay? Now we open the switch. If you open the switch here, this 5 ohm is hanging in the air. It's not connected to anything. But this is really how the circuit looks like. Now, a word of warning, and I mentioned that before. Um, if you if you select your inductor voltage to be this way, which I did here, if you, if you select your capacitor polarity voltage to be this way, then the capacitor voltage, capacitor current will be flowing this way from positive to negative, and the inductor current will be flowing this way. So the equation governing this circuit is that the capacitor current and the inductor voltage are opposite to one another. Okay, because this is the direction of IL, this is the direction of IC, and even though VL and VC are the same, because they are, because they are in parallel, but two currents are actually having opposite directions. So IC is equal to minus IL. What's IC? I can write IC as, uh, as, as C dVC by dT, and uh, VC is equal to VL. So we can write it that way, and then to get our differential equation. So we move forward. This is the equation here. This is I, I C minus I C is equal to I L. I replaced the I C, the capacitor current, by C D V C by D T. This is V C here. But V C is the same as V L. So I replaced V C by V L. And then I know that the inductor, the inductor, I have to get I what what is my target here? I want to write one the second order differential equation in terms of the inductor current. So I can get rid of VL and write it as L DIL by DT, and this why I end up with this second order derivative, second derivative here. This this was multiplying, um, uh, so here you get L D squared by DT, and then I move that one, this one to the other side, and then this becomes positive, positive here. So the sum of these two terms equal to zero. As we agreed, because the form that we have was d squared x by dt squared having coefficient of 1, I'm going to divide both sides by LC. So divide by LC, and this is what you end up having. So this term here is what we call the omega naught squared. The term, this is d squared x of t by dt squared plus 2 zeta naught omega naught dx by dt, which is not here because the first order derivative is 0 plus omega naught squared x of t is equal to f of t. This is omega naught squared. So omega naught squared is 1 over LC, or omega naught is 1 over squared LC. I have L and C. If you multiply them, you get 10 to the minus 5. If you take the square root and then if you, uh, you take the inverse, you get 316 radian per second. Now, because the first order derivative is missing here, we don't have DIL by DT, this means that 2 zeta omega naught, which is the coefficient of the first order derivative, is equal to 0. But omega naught is not equal to 0. This means that zeta naught is, zeta is equal to 0, okay? I call it here zeta naught, but it's actually zeta. It's, it's the parameter zeta, this dummy coefficient that we talked about. So we have a second order differential equation. We try to find the two roots. Because zeta is equal to 0, we have now uh, an under damped case. So this term is 0. You have two, uh, okay, so what we have here, uh, sorry, zeta, actually this term is still there. This is, zeta is equal to zero. This will give me square root of minus one. 
square root of minus 1 is j, is what we call j. So this will give me minus zeta omega naught plus or minus j omega naught. But zeta is 0, then my solutions are, I get two complex solutions, one is conjugate to the other, which is plus or minus j omega naught. So remember this, this square root here gave us j, because j is the square root of minus 1, as you learned from your previous math courses. And because zeta is 0, the real bar disappears. So this is the equation that we have. So we have only plus or minus j omega d. And we know if you have something like this, then our solution is e to the minus sigma t multiplying k1 cosine omega d t, t omega d t plus k2 sine omega d t. But, but k, sigma is 0. There is no zeta. Zeta is 0, then sigma is 0. Then uh, this is the solution that we have. How to get the coefficients k1 and k2? We impose the two, two conditions. At time 0, we know that the current, remember here we are solving for the inductor current. At time 0, the inductor current was 2. So if we put here t equal to 0, this will cancel. This will give me 1. Cosine 0 is equal to 1. Then you get 2 is equal to k1. Then I solve it for k1. Also, we know that at time 0, the inductor voltage is 0. Then VL, which is equal to L DIL by DT, is equal to the derivative of this term relative to t, and then you multiply it with L. The derivative of a cosine will give you minus sine, and then you multiply by, by 316. The derivative of the sine will give you cosine, and then you multiply by 316. This L will disappear after you set everything equal to 0. If you, would, if you set this equal to 0, then this term will disappear, and then you obtain only k2 multiplying 1, you get that k2 equal to 0. Okay, so we have only k1, and k1 is equal to 2, and its value is 2. Okay, so, uh, so, and this equation, by the way, does not have a particular integral. Why? Because when you put the inductor and capacitor in parallel, there is no source. The, the, the circuit is working only because of the energy that has been stored before uh, time zero in the inductor and the capacitor. Okay. So we don't have the other coefficients. Only one coefficient is equal to 2 cosine 316t, which is very interesting. Because this is telling you that the inductor current keeps on oscillating of half cycle going this way and half cycle going this way. Half cycle going this way and half cycle forever. It's an oscillator. It keeps on oscillating forever. Of course, in the reality, these wires have some resistance, and this resistance will result in loss of energy gradually and slowly, okay? So what's happening in the first part of the cycle? The inductor current will charge the capacitor. The capacitor voltage will increase. And then the capacitor voltage increased, and the inductor represents all very, very low resistance. The capacitor will start to charge in the inductor, okay? And then the inductor current will increase. And then the inductor current starts to switch direction. So every half cycle, one of them is charging the other. Okay, and the, so one is, is, is discharging to the other, and the inductor discharges the, induct, the capacitor, and the capacitor discharges the inductor. And they keep on switching energy between them every half cycle. So half the cycle, energy stored in the magnetic field here, and half the cycle, the, the energy stored in the electric field here. And this, is, this circuit is a very well-known circuit, electrical engineering, um, it, it's called the battery resonance circuit or it's called the tank circuit and it's used very often in filters and microwave engineering and control theory and power electronics and so on. Very famous circuit and very important to remember if you put an inductor and capacitor in parallel and they have energy and in the idle situation they keep on exchanging this energy forever and causing these oscillations with a frequency omega which is determined by the value of L and C. Because this term here is 1 over the square root LC.